Out of the ashes you will rise. If you feel sad, lost, depressed, finances are in the gutter, social life, you're lonely, out of the ashes you will rise. Here in my garage, invest in yourself. Always be curious. Don't be a cynic. Sleeping on a couch in a mobile home with only $47 in my bank account. When everything's burnt to the ground, when you're sad, lost, and depressed, and everything's at rock bottom, you get to rebuild the exact and precise way you want the damn thing rebuilt. Health, wealth, love, happiness, each of these four goals. Okay, everybody, welcome to the Ty Lopez podcast, SoundCloud, radio, whatever experience you want to call it. This is episode 101. We're talking about today what they should have taught us in school. So I got a live audience here. I actually brought a whole bunch of people from uh, my company, from my office, and I said, I want you to just, let's talk about a handful of topics that you wish they had taught you in school. I got my co-host, Zach AKA SeaWorld hat. People have been wondering about your hat, Zach. Hello. <laughs> We're running live here for some of you who are listening to the recording. Can we they see me? Yeah. If you see yourself in the live, that means they can see you. Um, oh, okay. For those of you listening at a later time, not live, you can always watch. I try to put these live on my Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter live. I'll probably have at least one to four hundred thousand people watching this live so it's kind of cool um so yeah we're running behind the scenes you can see me getting bothered when things aren't set up correctly somebody's commenting ty you're mean i'm not mean you have to differentiate in life mean and a realist we got people that are too optimistic they think everybody does a good job they think everybody's smart and then you have pessimists who think nobody does a good job and nobody's smart. I am neither. I am not an optimist or a pessimist. I am a realist. And the sooner you become a realist in your life, the quicker life gets together. The world needs more tough love. You know, I'm going to tell you a good story. I sat next to Kobe Bryant last year at the end of the season for uh, so the three out of the last four games he played before he retired. And there's a seat. It's the baddest ass seat you can sit in. Um, it's literally basically attached to the Lakers bench. It looks like on TV, people are watching me going, Ty, you playing for the Lakers? I'm sitting there on the end. And Kobe Bryant sits on the end or sat at the end for his last season. And he, there was a player, I won't say which player, but one of the players who's no longer with the Lakers was just, he was sucked that game. And I could hear Kobe Bryant, and I'm going to tell you this, I don't want to reveal everything I hear on the bench because I sit on the floor and you don't, I don't want these guys to not want to talk around me. But he was a lot harsher than you would think. Actually, if you know Kobe, you could believe it. Anyway, so Kobe's sitting there and he's talking to, I forget who he's talking to, Julius Randle or one of these guys, or Meta World Peace. And he said, you know what? This world needs less positive encouragement. Basically, exact words. And then he yelled out, so this player who was on the Lakers, who's no longer there, was, had missed, I mean, I think he airballed or something. So while the guy, there was a free throw, Kobe Bryant sitting there, yells out to his own player. He goes, you suck. Now there's two interesting lessons from this. Number one lesson, it wasn't D'Angelo Russell. It was, it was a bench player that was, he, Kobe Bryant yelled out. And he goes, you suck. And the guy turned around and he looked at Kobe during the free throw, a little break there. And he goes, I know. And he just looked at him like, I know, I'm sucking today. And the interesting thing is the next play, he went out and hit a shot. And the point that Kobe, I think, was trying to make, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but sometimes you got to just be real with people and be like, today you suck. And the flip side of that story is that sometimes you got to be like the player on the other end who's getting the truth told to them who doesn't get butt hurt and just says, you're right. And we live in a world now. That's one thing. I love Twitter. It's funny. It's its own ecosystem. If you want to learn social media and business, you got to be on Twitter, in my opinion. And um, everyone, Twitter, the, there's a lot I like about it, but there's a lot I hate. And what I, one thing I hate, it's literally people getting butt hurt about everything and 
and then it just feeds on each other. And so we live in a world where people like Kobe Bryant can't just tell the truth to somebody. Hey, you suck today. And the other side can't just go, you're right. Because then what happened the next play? He hit the shot. And so you have to encourage. There's a, there's a saying in the Bible. It says, and I, I don't know the exact verse, but it's actually in the Old Testament. It's a proverb. It says, encourage a fool and he'll get, I mean, uh, reprimand a fool and he'll get mad at you. Right? And you, you, and, but if you do it to a wise man, he's happy. He wants it. He, he, he asked to bring it on. Zach, you're a preacher, son. Find that verse. It's in Pro- Proverbs. Do you know it? <laughs> Zach's dad's a preacher. No, I don't know it. Not, <laughs> Not anymore. I used to. Zach, your mom. Zach's mom's. Vi- she's still visiting. Yeah, yeah. She'll she would be, be disappointed if yeah. you didn't have that me- memory. Uh, if you didn't have that Bible verse to memory, man. I blame the beer. <laughs> Zach's always shocking his mom. He's moved out here to Hollywood. He's got, he's, his mom goes, we went to a, uh, see Despicable Me, Me 3, and Zach's mom's like, Zach, why are you wearing sunglasses in a movie? <laughs> Zach saw a horror movie and couldn't understand it because it was too dark. <laughs> I was like, who are these people? <laughs> you know how horror movies are a little bit dark to start with? Here's Zach in there trying to piece together this horror show. What's the I first? created my own, my own story when I was watching it. Oh, yeah? I just made it all up. So yeah, what's yeah. the proverb? Uh, Proverbs 9, 8. Chapter 9, verse 8. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Yeah, there you go. You know? And I'm not I'm not. You want all? To, I'll say all versions. No, don't, don't say. Zach has 83 versions he wanted to give. But the point is, you got to ask yourself at some point, which one are you? You know? All right. What I wish they had taught us in school. First question. What do you got? How to approach investors. All right, we got a business question. Who here has a business idea? Who here has heard the saying, it takes money to make money? So some businesses, you're going to need investors. I've done businesses that I've launched completely just using my own money or very little money to start. But some businesses, I've raised investor cash. The first two businesses I ever launched, I got investors to put some money in. So how do you do it? So I'm going to give you three step, three steps that I've used. Okay. There's other steps. I'm just, I just can give you my experience. The number one step that I use to get investors is you have to kind of remind them of themselves. What do I mean by that? Well, look, usually smart investors believe in you as a person. That's why they invest. So a lot of people think that if you tell them an amazing idea that then they want to invest, but no good investors are smart. They realize it's all about the person. The quality of the person, because think about it. Someone has an amazing idea, but you feel like they're going to cheat you. You feel like they're lazy. You feel like they're stupid. You don't care about the idea. You're not going to give that human the money because they're going to waste it. So what that means is how you come off to them in terms of your skills really matters. So what do people love more than anything on planet earth? Do they love a good business idea? Do they love? No, they love themselves. Humans love themselves. Mark, if you take notes, humans love themselves. You know, Zach has advice for Tinder. For the most part, the way you get somebody on Tinder is because they think it's good for them. They're not thinking about you. They're not looking at Zach and going, with that flannel shirt and <laughs> sunglasses, my goal is to make his day. They mostly care about themselves. They want to find a date. That's what I tell them. I'm here for you. See, Zach's one step ahead. Do you find most people look at that outfit and go, that's what I'm looking for? Most most uh, the, of the ladies look at that outfit and they want to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not in the way I wish they would want to take it off. It's usually to get rid of it. Oh, they want to take it off and yeah, make you go shopping for something Yeah, yeah. Better. It's a different kind of... Uh, see, I, I, I try to sexy. make you think they, they want me. But I see what really, you did there. Zach's very witty. This is my witty friend. Um, that's why he's the co-host here. Or I'm his co-host, actually. He's the host. I'm the not straight man. Yeah. We're the st- <laughs> you said it. Okay. So when an investor uh, is thinking about oh, when you're approaching them, at some point, this investor, especially if they made their own money and didn't inherit it, they were smart. They were 
you know, they had that gleam in their eye. They were hungry. They were ambitious. And if you remind them of that when you're talking, then you're working on, oh, on a psychological trigger, which is called the liking bias. So there's 25 cognitive biases of the human brain that psychologists and scientists have found. The most powerful ones are reward, pain. There's complicated ones like Kantian fairness and reciprocity, urgency, uh, chemical bias, all these. But one of the top five biases is the liking bias. If people like you as a human and what makes them like you, you remind them of themselves or you will provide some reward to them, like Zach taking off his clothes for the Tinder ladies. Do they see that as a reward or is that pain bias? Uh, it's like tomato, tomato. <laughs> no reward. Uh, a tomato, off. tomato situation. Yeah. So that's the first thing. You got to come off not in your words, not in your ideas as somebody that's excited, that's smart, that's sharp, that knows what they're doing. Number two, and this is very important, um, you got to weave a story because people often talk about their product. They'll be like, oh, you know, I got an app. This is, a, I'll tell you a very common app idea. People nowadays, when I'm like, what business do you want? They go, I've got the next Uber of blank. Okay. That's a dime a dozen. It might be a good idea. And people also, this is a common one, a video dating app. I've had a thousand people. In fact, yesterday, somebody pitched that to me. Ty, a video dating app where instead of pictures, you see videos. Okay. That's just an idea. It doesn't get me excited. If you've got some angle, some story that's relatable, for example, let's say you had an idea. Another common one is, uh, like, um, let's just do the video dating one. Cause that's the actual one that someone did pitch to me yesterday. So I would tell a story. I'd be like, all right, I'm out. Uh, I'm, I'm at home one night. I go on a dating site. I go on Tinder or match.com. This gorgeous girl appears in my feed and she replies to me and we start emailing and she lives an hour away, but she's so beautiful. And I draw, I, you're talking to the investor. And you're like, and I drove all the way there and I was so excited and I canceled my bit. I took a day off from work and then I got there and that picture must have been from five years before because they, you know, they were nothing. I won't even say, I'm afraid to say what, you know, we'll just say they didn't, they weren't attractive, <laughs> right? If I just had had a video, I would have been able to confirm that because it's hard to lie on video. You can lie on a picture. It's hard to lie on video. Now. I started, and you're still talking to your investor. You're weaving a story. So I went and I, I, I texted 10 of my closest friends that are single. And I said to them, without leading the question, I just said to them, what's the biggest problem you've had with online dating? And here's the, my informal survey. It's not statistically significant, but it's somewhat significant because it's, you know, 10 of my friends. Seven of them said the number one problem is the person doesn't look, speak, or come off like I thought they did uh, would when I saw them online. And so it's a real problem. And people, I asked them, would you pay for a, a app that you could see the person? And out of those seven people that had that problem, six of them say yes. So this is just, this is a good idea. And then you, so just that, and that's just a story off the cuff. Obviously, if I was pitching to a real investor, right? I would come and really think this through, but you see how the power of a story versus just having a slideshow where you go, you know, it's like Ollie G one of my favorite Borat, uh, was it Borat? Or, no, it's Ollie G when he goes to an investor, you got to Google. This. this is the funniest Ollie G he goes to the investor and he, and he, he's trying to pitch him on the ice cream glove. And he goes, he goes, he has a, a little whiteboard and he writes out, he goes, you need to invest in me because Here's how many people have hands. It's so it's ice cream gloves. So the ice cream doesn't drip on you. He goes number of humans who have hands and he's like 7 billion number of people who like, like ice cream, 6 billion. I multiply those together and that's my, and I multiply it times $14 a glove and the market for this is $48 trillion. Okay. Believe it or not, that's how a lot of people, what's funny is the investor go, there's two investors sitting in a room just shows you how weird people are. One guy goes, 
that may be the worst idea <laughs> I've ever heard. And the other investor who hadn't figured out that the Ollie G show is a joke, HBO joke, the other guy's like, no, I can kind of see it. You put the glove on. I'm thinking this guy's an idiot. All this, you do is throw numbers in front of his face and yeah, he's sold. Yeah, he's sold. So occasionally that idea will work, but a story works a lot better. Don't just do your, your ice cream glove numbers. Okay, so that's number two to get investors. Number three, um, start with people you know because trust is built over time. If you go to all, I see people pitching all people that they've never met. Now, you might be like me and you grew up not knowing anybody who had much money, but at least then look, go for after friends of friends at least, okay? Because if you go, it's harder if you don't. Now, if you already have a track record with, in, with investors investing in you, it's much easier, but I'm assuming this is a first-time thing for you. So try to go to a, friends of the family and their friends. Two, you know, they call it the your circle of influence, try to go too deep maximum. Okay. That's a great question. We're talking about what they should have taught us in school. We just talked about investors. Next question from our live audience. Say your name, what you do. These are people who work for me today. I invited from the office. Hey guys, I'm Alex. I'm part of the marketing department here with Ty Lopez. And something that I wish they would have taught us in school is how to do your taxes. What's the Ooh. best piece of advice with that? That's a good question. We're talking about practical. This, on this session, I do different podcasts. This one's all practical stuff they should have taught us in school. If you're listening to the podcast or if you're listening on SoundCloud, welcome. Let's get into this. Here's the deal with taxes. You know the old saying, the only thing sure in life is death and taxes. There's other things that you're sure of too besides that. Death, taxes, somebody in life will betray you. Rejection, uh, pain. <laughs> that Zach, Zach's Tinder account will be funny to log into and, walk and read through. What, what's your opening line? How are your morals? How are your morals? Do you, you have a backup line for that? You mean if they respond? No, like, do you say that to every single girl? How well, are your morals? Yeah, Does your well, mom know about that? It depends on how busy I am that day. I can just copy and paste. It's a lot easier. So you're a copy and paster on Tinder? I'm busy. Okay. I've got a lot of Tinder to respond to. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. So let's talk about taxes. Bring it a little closer. There we go. Here's the deal with taxes. The number one thing to know is, unless you are an actual accountant background, I highly recommend that you hire an accountant, even when you don't have much money. One of the big problems, especially for those of you who have started a business or are thinking of starting a business, on day one, not using a professional accountant, preferably somebody with three letters behind their name, CPA. It's not that much more expensive to get a real CPA, Certified Public Accountant. It's a hard title to have. They're basically licensed. It's tough to get. It's like a medical doctor. All right, they're gonna do a better job most likely than somebody who's not a CPA. There's good people, there's something called an EA, which is an enrolled agent, which basically means they've kind of been certified by the IRS kind of thing that they're good with taxes. But CPA is even better than an EA. Usually, there are exceptions where EAs are better. CPAs have to have a certain amount of college. This is, an, this is a, a profession where a college degree, I do think helps. You guys know I'm a college dropout. I don't always think college is good, but sometimes college is good. And that's a specific, you know, medical doctor, it's good. College is good. Med school. You want to become a doctor, go to med school. You want to be a surgeon, go to med school. You're not going to learn Please. that. Please don't experiment <laughs> on people. <laughs> I'm just going to go set up in Mexico. I'm going to just learn. I'm just going to go till, I'm, till I learn. You're going to kill a lot of people. There's an old saying, the young doctor fattens the graveyard. So please don't fatten the graveyard, kill people. So, number one, get a CPA. But, number two, there are some things you should know. And here's one of the most important things. In most countries, and I'm speaking specifically to the United States tax code. Uh, somebody said, the dudes in the back look nervous. You guys look nervous? Over there? <laughs> <laughs> we should have, why don't one or two of you sit on the end versus right there? I'm, I'm, it might be good, because it, it, there's an empty seat right there. It's almost you, like we can see what you guys... Could you sit on the end there? Yeah, it'll look better. It's almost like we get to peek in on what they're like on their first dates. There we go. Are you guys nervous yeah. on We're your first date? We're getting a date? little uh, sneak peek. You don't get nervous? 
He's he's got ice in his blood. Okay, so number two, I was talking about you in most states, really all states of the United States, and most countries follow similar laws, but they are different. The U.S., for example, is the only country in the world that taxes you on worldwide income you earn. So if you're an American and you make money in a business that you operate in Mozambique or Japan or Russia, okay, you have to pay taxes in the U.S. Mo almost no other country in the world does that. Sweden, for example, if you live in Sweden, that's why a lot of Swedish people or Norwegian people, this is a billionaire, a famous guy, he's a big shipping billionaire. He left Norway and he goes in, I think he's in Malta or Cyprus. You know why? Because Malta and Cyprus basically have no taxes or Dubai is another country with almost no taxes. And in Norway, if you leave and make that money outside, you don't have to pay Norwegian taxes, which are high. They're about 50 to 60% total taxes, okay? Plus some other taxes, they got pensions on. In America, that won't help you. Now, yes, there are American corporations that get around the U.S. tax code by setting up offshore companies. It's If you're a C corporation, there's more power to do some of this. You also can get a tax credit as a U.S. person. So if you operate a business in Mozambique, okay, and you pay Mozambique taxes, if there's a treaty with the United States, some of those taxes will be reduced in the U.S. and you'll pay them over. But, so that's the bad news if you're an American citizen or the good news if you're not an American citizen. The good news for Americans and many other countries, a lot of countries this way, is that if you own your own business, part-time or full-time, it's got to be a legitimate business. You can't do this, have some, people used to set up, fake, rich people used to set up fake horse farms. They used to buy you really expensive horses and then deduct all their expenses. We should, by the way, let's, let's enter. We should have, why don't you two come here? It'll be better for all you because we don't see you at all in here. So in the United States, um, the best legitimate way to save on taxes that the IRS allows you will if you do it right, it's not breaking any laws is to own a part or full-time business. Okay. And then you can deduct a lot of things legally. Now, if you watch the tax debate, I mean, the debates with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, there is a very interesting thing that polarized because some people thought Trump was a genius. And of course, some people hated Trump. She talked about how he got out of so much taxes. And he said, yeah, that's because I'm smart. <laughs> that was a pretty powerful line. Love him or hate him on that specific point. The question is, do you want to pay more taxes than you legally have to? I'm not talking about breaking the law or even ethically breaking the law. But if you own a business, part of the reason that Donald Trump, and I probably shouldn't bring up Donald Trump because people are so emotional about politics, but the reason he was able to deduct $1 billion one year is because he lost the billion dollars. So in America, when you lose money or you have a ex legitimate expense that's really for business, you don't have to pay taxes on that. It subtracts out. It's a, called a business deduction. Now you need to ask your CPA because some people try to do shady stuff and, and deduct stuff that's not deductible. For example, certain things are very hard to deduct. You can't buy clothes for your business and say, I needed a nice suit, I can deduct it. There's specific laws that said, no, you can't do that. Also, sports tickets. Some people will go and try to spend, there's specific laws on sport tickets. So if you wanna go see the Lakers or the Knicks, there's some limitations on your tax stuff. So again, the biggest picture thing to understand going to your question is owning a business is a great way. Now, let's talk to number three. When you don't own a business, for those of you who don't own a business, there's nothing wrong. Not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur because some people have to work. They're called intrapreneurs. Some people, like the people behind me here who work for me, they're what I call intrapreneurs. They're working inside of an entrepreneurial company, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, believe it or not, some of the richest people in the world are intrapreneurs too. An example is Bill Gates was an entrepreneur. He started... He started Microsoft with Paul Allen, two guys, but he's made more people millionaires who were employees because they got stock options. 
Another guy that became wealthy who was not a, a, the initial entrepreneur, Steve Ballmer. I had dinner with him. He's worth $28.5 billion. And he was an executive, but he was a, an employee. So, no, but if you are an employee, that means in the United States, you get what's called a W-2. The end of the year, they issue you this thing called a W-2, which is how much your paychecks were for. Now in the US, most of the time, they're subtracting out your taxes every paycheck. As long as you say the right amount of deductions that you have, so you can't make up children that you have because you get a tax deduction for children. So you can't lie. Some people try to lie. They'll be like, I got eight kids or four kids and they really have none. Don't do that. I'm going to tell you this. There's certain people you want to mess with in the world. Don't mess with the IRS. These dudes are no joke. Even Al Capone, one of the most powerful godfather, you know, gang uh, gangsters of all time. What did he go to jail for? Did he go for jail for one of the massacres he did? I think it was called the Valentine Day Massacre. Uh, let me tell you how powerful Al Capone was. A little side note, I love history. Al Capone at one point during the height of the prohibition when he was powerful, I think this is in the 1920s, a judge pisses him off. Al Capone walks in the courtroom, walks all the way down the hall during a session when the court was in session, goes up to the judge and punches him in the face, turns around, puts his coat back on and walks out. And not one person touched Al Capone because every policeman in that courtroom was on his payroll. That's a lot of power for a gangster, right? But even all that power, the IRS got him. And so you see people messing with the IRS, be careful. Be careful with the IRS. And the quickest way to get in trouble with the IRS is not follow these rules I've given. Number one, not use a CPA. Because then you're not even trying to do something wrong and you make a mistake. When you got a good CPA on your side and they're not that expensive, you can get an, a CPA, you, you know, H&R Block or one of these firms. I forget the other one, tax something or other. A lot of times you can get your taxes done for a 200 bucks a year. And I know that's a lot of money, but that welcome to the world. You wanna make a lot of money, you're gonna pay some taxes. And you're gonna pay somebody to help you do it right. And if you, here's why it's usually not a real expense. The $200 you spend, they'll probably save you that much in telling you about a tax deduction you didn't know about. Don't do your own taxes, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And number three, that'll help you when you're an employee because there are certain deductions you can get. If you have children, there's things if you have a, a home mortgage, there's things if you have a disability, I think now, um, and I'm not a CPA, so check with the CPA, but there's tons of legal deductions that you can get. Um, one of my friends told me about a deduction. I haven't even looked into it to its, if it's true. He said there's some kind of deduction if you do an event at your house, it was, you can deduct how much it would have cost if you would have done the event at a hotel. I never heard of it before. I don't know if it's legit, but he swears his CPA told him. But a good CPA is going to look through your taxes and be like, oh, boom, 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 boom. Don't underpay or overpay your taxes. That's my advice. Do you and, think the uh, rich pay their fair share in taxes? Good It's a good talking point. Let's talk about the rich. I feel like you're trying to catch me in my words because no matter what, what you say, somebody's going to be mad. So and I would also ask, should we define rich? Okay. Because that's kind of a broad. So what's the definition statement? of rich? I think a good definition of truly rich, if you go on the IRS website, people who make over $450,000 a year are in the 99.99 percentile. It's very rare for somebody in America, and this applies to all countries, okay, um, to make over $450,000 a year. So let's just call it that. Should people who make over, I was surprised. I thought it would be, you know, there's only about 70 people in the United States who make over $50 million a year. Very few, very few. That's less than 10. I said 70. I said oh, less, I thought you said seven. I said there's less than 70 and Zach said that's less. <laughs> Zach is a product of the public school <laughs> right. system in America. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so if you if people should people who pay make over four hundred fifty thousand dollars pay more taxes here's the truth about it which is going to hurt some people's feelings but i seem to not care if i hurt people's i mean i try not to hurt people's feelings but i told you at the beginning that i'm a realist i'm not a pessimist or an optimist here's the realistic thing even if you got bill gates 
to put all his money, spread it out. And he just says, I give all my money to Americans. So let's just say he has $100 billion. We're going to do a math question. I'm, I'm going to give away uh, Beats by Dre to whoever comes up with this math. There's 350 million Americans. If he gave away $100 billion, how much would it go to each person? I need to do the math myself on my head. Let's just say, yeah, I think I know it already, but... My calculator cuts off at 100 million, so I'm not going to be able to do this. <laughs> Somebody said 3.5 billion. No, I can tell you that's wrong. It's very easy to do it. Three times 350 is a billion. And then you multiply that by 100. So the answer is 300. Confirm my math. You can do it in one cool little trick for you guys. Go to your Chrome. If you use Chrome as your browser, the top where you type in the URL of the address of the website you want to go into, it's also a calculator. So just divide 100 billion, 100 with nine zeros, by three, let's just call it 350 million. 350 and then six zeros. Am I right on this? I did it in my head in a couple of seconds. So I could have made a mistake. So it's 300 bucks. So let me ask you, would it change the whole world? Would it really help America? Would it fix poverty in America for Bill Gates to give away every penny that he has? No, it would only give people 300 bucks, which is not bad. It'd be great. Everybody here would be happy to have 300 bucks, but would that change you? Would you go, would you now have, you know, live in luxury? No. So the real solution is you can't tax people enough to completely solve the problem of poverty. And I'm all for ending poverty. The solution to ending hunger and starvation of poverty, if you talk to a smart economist, okay, is one thing. And that is you must increase the productivity of every person. So, everybody, so productivity in the 1700s was very low per person. Everyone in America was this much productive. Now, because we have technology, one person can do a lot. I mean, think about it. Think about what one person can do now. One farmer can grow enough food for, let's say, 30,000 people. I'm just guessing, okay? But I'm sure it's around that ratio. Easy. You look at a grain farmer sitting in a tractor nowadays in Iowa running a big co a combine gathering wheat, harvesting wheat for bread. One guy can do hundreds of acres with satellite technology. Back in the 1700s, no matter, one guy could do one acre. So the solution is technology and education for people. You, you have to make people smarter. And so sometimes people get mad and like, Ty, you show pictures of Lamborghinis on your, for, on, your, on your Instagram. You have girls in bikinis, even though I own a bikini company. Um, and I'm like, you guys don't get it, do you? I'm motivating people to get smarter. And you know what makes people smarter? Rewards. Doesn't, you know, so the answer, Zach, is you can tax the rich more or less. It ain't solving the problem. And that's why I don't like politics that much. It, probably some people pay too, some rich people pay too little and probably some rich people pay too much. But it don't matter because it ain't fixing you and I situation. If you don't have enough money, you could go and try to hijack the bank account. And remember, and so this is the second part of your question, which drives me nuts. Be very careful of getting all your information from news reporters. News reporters, either they're biased. Oh, this is my experience with reporters. A lot of them, not all of them, a lot are dumb or act smarter than they are. Because let me just a ask you this. What do you think? So Bill Gates has approximate, almost a net worth of $100 billion, a little under. Do you think he has a big room full of cash that he hoards it and goes, Mwahaha, and it's like, he's like Golem and he's like, my ring, my cash. No, all of his, most of, I bet you Bill Gates doesn't keep more than 10% of his money liquid. That means 90%. It probably is higher. 90%. That's $90 billion he has in bank accounts. What does the bank do? They loan out money to individuals to buy houses. You and I are probably touching 
some of Bill Gates' money right now in your Bank of America or Citibank or HSBC. It's recirculating throughout the world. Bill Gates bought, even you could argue, well, he bought this big mansion. He's got this like 50 room house with electronics. So you could argue, but you know how many people he employed to build that? That house probably cost him 50 million bucks. Do you think he took the $50 million and burned it? No, he gave it to people and then they went out. Somebody got paid 100 grand, one of the subcontractors. That guy took the 100 grand and he put it on a down payment on a house for himself and his kids or used it to put his kids in college or whatever. So people are very idiotic when it comes to how money circulates. The way you fix the problems in the world is one way and one way only. And that is Jesus. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were doing a giveaway. I was trying to uh, answer. This is not a religious show. Zach, like I said, grew up. Uh, he said, Jesus, it, this is not religious. I'm not that religious. But no, you make people smarter. In every country in the world where you've made people smart. Nelson Mandela has a great quote. I, I wish I had memorized it perfectly. But, and this is, you know, the man who helped break up apartheid in South Africa. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. And he said, education is what took a kid from because he was born in a village in like a very primitive upbringing and he said it's what took a kid from a small village and made him the leader of a nation so you got to know stuff that's the solution i'd rather instead of arguing whether you're going to take 36 percent or 30 because here's the truth also zach everything is not black and white if you tax the rich more, there are some huge advantages. More money will be available to give, let's say, to the poor. But what is, does anybody know this law of physics? For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So I'll give you an example going back to Tinder with Zach's story. If you take a picture of you that doesn't really look like you, it's one of those pictures you were at your absolute best, Right? Like we all have that picture where you're like, damn, why well, don't I always look at like it? If you post that to your Tinder or your match.com, you will get a reaction. What's the reaction? You will get pro less or more dates. You can get more. But every action has an opposite in what? Equal reaction. When you show up on that date and that girl or guy is expecting, you know, Ryan Gosling and freaking Angelina, uh, Adriana Lima, and you come in looking like, Humpty, Zach. Humpty Dumpty, yeah, or Zach, <laughs> what's the reaction you get? You go home alone. And so same with taxes. If you just say, never tax the rich, let the rich have as much money as they want. Okay, there's some advantages that the rich will then have more money. They'll invest in new businesses. A lot of rich guys invest in businesses. So that's good. But the downside is some poor people like Meals on Wheels got cut. Some poor people will suffer. But the flip side also has its problems. And that's why one of my favorite sayings in life is, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. So pick your poison. I put two famous sayings together. Pick your poison is an ancient one, like a Socrates one. And there are no trade, there are no solutions to anything. There, so there's no solution to your Twitter problem. There's only trade-offs. If you put a better picture of you, you get more disappointed dates, but you get more of them, and maybe one of them likes your personality. If you put your worst ugly picture, you get less dates, but the trade-off is anybody who goes out with you probably doesn't care about how you look. You see? So you got to be smart. We're, full, we're in a world where people are dumb. There's a lot of idiotic uh, and bad logic in this world. When it comes to money, people are stupid. Okay. That was a good question by Zach. We're getting ready to end this episode. But guess what? I'm recording three episodes at once. <laughs>